Hello, my lovelies, and welcome back to a special episode of Bedtime Stories with Celosia Crane. On this New Year's Eve, I'm going to share with you an original story that I wrote and set in my Gaslight Fantasy world. What is Gaslight Fantasy? Gaslight Fantasy is not quite steampunk, but it carries over elements of the Victorian world into a fantasy setting, and that is what I have done here. My city port Apollo is at the center of a revival of belief in the Greek gods and goddesses, and my main character in this story, Eugenie, is about to have an encounter of her own. So sit back, relax, and let me read to you the story of the Hound of Hecate. I stared out the grimy, soot-smeared window. A single spiderweb crack ran through the pane, emitting a tiny draft. The city that lay beyond the glass was not much better. Full of dirt and noise, people overcrowding the streets and alleys. Factories spit their poisonous clouds from their chimneys, the smoke and ash staining everything and everyone. Behind me, the bare room was full up. There were seven of us living in this one cell-like room. Seven of us trying our damnest to stay off the streets. Behind me, Gertrude and Ralph were arguing over something yet again. Gertie's thin, shrill voice rising higher and higher as she tried to argue against Ralph's deeper baritone. The timber of their voices washed over me, hard and sharp. Just like everything else. Just like my life. I tried to focus my gaze on the columns of the Temple to Athena that stood on the highest point of Port Apollo furthest away from the noise and dirt of the harbor and from the narrow alleyways full of the poor workers, tried to drown out their endless bickering. This room was at least better than a penny sit-up, if for no other reason than it was our own. Suddenly, Gertie's voice turned into a shrill screech and there came the sound of a slap, the cracking sound of skin-against-skin contact. Then, nothing but sobbing. Turning around, I walked through the maze of mats on the floor and made my way to the door. I'll be back, I tossed over my shoulder as I went out, ignoring Gertie's tears and shutting the door behind me. The hallway was even more barren than our room, the paint and plaster peeling from the walls while the wood planks of the floor were grooved from continuous foot traffic. I made my way down the narrow stairs and opened the door that led out onto the street. Pulling my tattered wool shawl tightly about my shoulders, I turned away from the crowds hurrying down toward the harbor and the incoming merchant vessel. Instead, I faced myself uphill and started to walk. The chilly late fall afternoon was enough to make my ears and the tip of my nose burn with cold after a few minutes. I ignored them and continued along the broad cobbled street. Carts and horses were winding their way up and down from the busy harbor. Trade had been very good this year and Port Apollo was booming. Factories had cropped up along the Acheron River south of the Necromantion. The smoke that billowed from their towers as they labored day and night to produce cotton, timber, and other sundries only polluted the sky even more. Pausing at a street corner, I leaned against a building wall and willed my breath back into a semblance of order. The slight niggling cough that had developed in my chest these last few weeks reappeared, and it took a long moment to overcome the spasms. My lungs now joined my ears and nose in burning with the cold as I sucked in the air, trying to return my breathing to normal. Looking up the hill, my destination was well in sight. 
the temple of Hecate was just visible at the crossroads ahead of me. Hecate, my patron goddess. I often wound my way to her temple when I needed a break from the dirt and the noise. There maybe I would find a few moments of peace and warmth tonight before beginning the climb back down the hill to the poor cold room overcrowded with people. Pushing away from the wall, I stood for a moment. There was a tug on my skirt as I stood there staring up at the roof of the temple. Glancing down, I smiled at the thin child who was staring up at me. I often saw these children about the city. This coming winter was going to be a hard one for many of them. Glancing at this girl, I couldn't help but see the way that her cheeks hollowed beneath her cheekbones, and how sunken her eyes were. I could see her thin neck disappearing into the round collar of a plain and quite oversized wool dress that was ripped and torn in places. The hollows at the base of her neck echoed the impressions left by her face. She, like so many other young children in this city, was starving. Please, miss, she held out a thin, claw-like hand. Can you spare me a coin? I'm so hungry. Her voice was pleading, and yet it held a despairing, keening wail. My chest constricted as I stared down into her pale, pinched face. I drew my breath in slowly and exhaled again before responding. Blinking in the fading light, I saw her future in a flash. I knew that if I did not help her now, then no one would, and she would be dead by morning. Her tiny, frozen body would be found in an alleyway, wrapped in old newspapers. Glancing once more up the street toward the temple, I knew what Hecate would have me do. What is your name? I watched her eyes go wide as she stared up at me. Pearl, miss. I nodded, smiling a very gentle smile. A very fitting name. I shifted my hand in through the side slit in my skirt and pulled two pennies out of my pocket. Dropping the coins into the little girl's hand, I smiled. Those pennies should buy you a good dinner if you go to Barney's Pie Shop in the next street. Tell him Eugenie sent you, and he might even throw in a donut. I watched the light glow from her sunken eyes as she closed her talon-like fist over the precious coins. I will do that. Thank you, miss. Thank you. She bobbed a curtsy, a very rough and reprehensible attempt, and then proceeded to turn around and dash away quickly, as though afraid that I was going to change my mind and demand my coin back. With the cough gone for the time being and my breathing once more under control, I stepped forward toward the temple. There were few people entering the hall this evening, but even so the fires near the altar burned brightly. Stepping forward, I found my usual place and sank down to my knees to offer up my prayers. How long I actually sat there, I don't know. I often lost track of time when I was in prayer. It was a sound that broke through my repetitions. The clicking of nails on stone. A pace similar to that of a dog, maybe? It was slow and even. It approached me and then stopped. After a few moments, the sound of a dog panting softly drew me fully conscious and I opened my eyes. Turning my head slowly, I met the large golden eyes of a beautiful black dog. Its pointed ears stood up high on its head, and its muzzle was long, exhibiting gleaming white canines as its tongue lolled out of its mouth. It blinked slowly, then rose to all four legs and turning began to walk toward the door leading further back into the complex of the temple. Once it reached the door, it turned and stared at me, as though waiting for me to follow it. Rising slowly to my feet, I moved to follow the dog in a slow, somnolent manner, for one did not ignore the companion of Hecate. Once I reached it, I moved through the door and into the inner heart of the temple. We passed doors that led into smaller chambers, where devotees were sitting at tables transcribing writings or reading scrolls. 
Further into the heart of the temple there was a large kitchen where women were busy about various tables, pounding dough into loaves and trimming fat away from large sections of meat. The dog barked as it entered the kitchen, and a comely-looking woman glanced toward it. Ah, so you've returned, have you, and brought another of your mistress's specials with you? Another quick, sharp bark, then the black dog sank down on its hindquarters and stared with its liquid gold eyes. The cook propped her fists on her hips and chuckled. Well, I've never denied you before, have I? Turning back around, she grabbed a large bone from a recently dressed hindquarter and tossed it toward my companion. Then, picking up something else that lay on the table beside her, she turned and walked over to where I was standing. Here you go, miss. Our friend here, she indicated the dog, never does anything that isn't for a purpose. Eat that meat roll quick and then hurry on to whatever you've been called to this night. I took the warm, flour-dusted roll that she had handed me and ripped it in half. A savory ground meat filled the center, and the smells of the meat and spices wafted to my nose, and I ate it greedily. With the hot, filling food in my stomach, the dog left off gnawing on the bone and bumped me with her head. I laughed softly, because it was almost like she was asking if I was ready. Turning, I followed the ebony creature back out into the temple's main hall, and then outside and down the steps. It had almost gone full dark, and I wrapped my shawl even more tightly about my shoulders as I tried to keep up with the dog, who was moving more quickly now. Down a side street, through an alley, across a plaza, she led me on a pretty chase before stopping in a wintry park by a gazebo. A single figure sat in the gazebo, a black cape obscuring their face from my view. The black dog trotted up and sat down beside this figure before turning its head and staring at me as though saying, Well, what are you waiting for? I stepped hesitantly forward, and as I entered the gazebo, the figure stood up. A small, long creature ran out from beneath her dress and came toward me, chittering warningly. A rich, warm sound emanated from the hood of the cape then, a soft, chuckling laugh. Don't mind her. She's very protective about those who come near me. Looking down at the dark brown polecat with its white mask and sharp teeth, she whispered a few words and it ran back to her. Scaling her dress as though it had been doing it every day, it perched on her shoulder. Thank you for listening, Eugenie. She sank back down on the bench she had occupied and patted the empty space beside her. I was a little fearful that you would not follow my black hound, but I had a feeling, when you shared what little you have with our young Pearl, that you would indeed follow my messengers. I moved forward hesitatingly, and almost against my own will. If I were to believe her, then I was actually in the presence of my goddess, Hecate herself. Sinking down onto the stone, I tried to make sure that I was not touching a single part of her clothing or cloak. A movement made me flinch back. But she was simply lifting her arms, clad in long black gloves, to draw back the hood of her cape from her face. In the limited moonlight that came through the clouds and smoke, she was very beautiful. But in the dark, it was hard to tell for sure. What do you require of me? My lips trembled as I spoke, still trying to come to the realization that I was sitting face to face with the god that I venerated. I knew that after this night, nothing was going to be the same. Hecate reached over and laid a hand upon my knee. Not much more than you have done already in my name. Through my skirt and petticoats, I could feel the warmth of her hand. Little Pearl whom you fed this evening is important to me. I need you to help me to bring her to the temple, where I can safeguard her. She paused for the briefest moment. And you were quite right. She would have died this night without your interference. Do not doubt your visions, child, for I have sent them. I shook my head. 
How can I find her? The streets and alleys are so filled with the poor these days that finding one little girl seems all but impossible. Here she grinned, and her white teeth shone brightly in the thin moonlight. Ah, but you shall have Hecabe and Gale to help you search. With these two at your side you shall not fail. Raising her hands up, she lifted the polecat down from her shoulder. Now, Gail, I need you to behave yourself. Eugenie will require your sharp nose and cunning intellect, if she is to save our pretty pearl. She placed the polecat on the bench between us before turning to the black dog, who had now been named for me. Hecabe, go with her. Help and protect her. We must find Pearl tonight. There was an urgency to her tone that now caught my attention. Excuse me, my lady, why is it so important that I bring her to you tonight? Hecate's voice grew very somber. As I told you, she is starving near to death. And while the food that you helped her purchase has kept her body from fading while it is light, the cold that is coming this evening will sap everything and take her away from me. She rose to her feet, drawing her hood up once more. Pearl is a very powerful magi. She just doesn't know it yet. We need to make sure that she is kept safe and educated to understand her powers and gifts. She sighed, her shoulders rising and falling with a gesture. This world is too cruel by far. With that, she turned and walked away, leaving me sitting alone in the gazebo with her two companions. After a brief moment of stunned silence, Hakabe rose to all fours and gave a sharp little bark. I nodded my head. Yes, I understand. Getting to my feet, I watched as the black dog began to move away from the gazebo and back toward the dark maze of alleyways and narrow streets. Hikabe, wait. It is too dark and my eyes are not as sharp as yours. Gale twittered angrily from up ahead before scampering away in the odd little run that is unique to polecats and ferrets. The large black dog turned her head and watched me as I caught up with her. Bumping my hand with her head, she let me know that I could touch her. So, with my hand on her head, we continued into the dark maze. Ahead of us, a strange rattling sound like metal being dragged across the pavement came closer and closer. Stopping very near to us, I heard Gail's chittering tones and knelt down to see what she had brought back with her. A heavy candle lantern with a large candle affixed in the center met my hands. I lifted it, unlit, and carried it with me. I could hear Gail's paws as she ran off into the darkness once more, this time returning with a long, thin straw. I chuckled softly. How clever you are, little Gail. Nearing the corner of a street, there was a large metal barrel filled with burning rubble. Groups of people were gathered about it, warming their hands, oblivious to everyone else. Taking Gail's piece of straw... I lit it from the fire and managed to light the wick of the candle in the lantern. I followed the two animals as they led me down paths and through alleys. Finally, Gail scampered down a flight of steps and in front of a heavy iron bolted door, I saw the bundle of newspapers from my earlier vision. Drawing a few pages away, I saw the drawn face. Cold had pinched her features even more than when I had first seen her earlier this evening. She was shaking badly from the cold, but I could see she was still breathing. She's still alive. The words escaped my lips on a rush, and the tight coil of fear that had been winding itself even more tightly in my chest as we had searched relaxed. I had found her, and she was still alive. Unwrapping my shawl from around my shoulders, I leaned down towards the poor child. Pearl, I said her name quietly, trying not to frighten her. However, her large, sunken eyes flew open at the sound. She started up, as though ready to run. Pearl, wait! I reached out a hand. 
Don't you remember me? From earlier this evening. She paused, and in the light from the candle lantern I could see her eyes narrow in on my face before her entire posture relaxed. Oh, it's you, miss. I smiled. Yes, it's me. What are you doing here? This isn't the right place for you. You ought not be here. She glanced around wildly, and in that moment she spied Hikabe. Is that dog yours? I shook my head, though I heard the fear in her voice. No, I don't rightly think Hikabe belongs to anyone, except maybe to the goddess Hikate. I reached out a hand. But don't worry, she won't hurt you. The thin face turned back to me. Why are you here, miss? I ain't done nothing wrong. Reaching out a hand, I offered her my shawl, and she grabbed it eagerly. That is a story for another time, Pearl, a time that isn't quite so cold. I laughed softly, not wanting the child to realize that I was starting to get cold as well. But in truth, I've come to take you somewhere warm, where you'll get enough to eat and be taught a lot of very fascinating things. She froze, her eyes narrowed with anger and suspicion. I won't go back to the poorhouse. You can't make me. She almost darted to try and run away, but then Gail was there, chittering angrily at her. She jumped back, staring down at the little brown pole cat. I promise you, Pearl, I wouldn't take you there to begin with. I know only too well the kind of cheer the poor house provides. I grew up in one, and truthfully, I've barely even escaped that. I lifted the lantern and began to walk up the steps. No, where we are going, no one will abuse you, and you will have freedom to learn what you wish. At the top of the stairs, I turned and looked down at the poor, thin creature. Hecate herself sent me to find you. She is quite concerned about you and wants you to come to her house. Pearl came up the stairs hesitantly, and in that moment I realized she wore no shoes. Her poor feet were purple, and the skin cracked in many places. The goddess? She's real? Her voice was hesitant and hopeful. Reaching out my hand, I took her cold, thin one within mine. Yes, she is very real. Now come, it is time for us to go. There was no more resistance, and she came with me willingly. Hikabe let out a soft bark and led the way while Gail hopped and jumped ahead of us. Sooner than I thought, we were climbing the stairs toward the main temple hall. Then, Hikabe was leading us through to the inner complex again, leading us towards the kitchen whose great hearth had been bedded down for the night, illuminating the large cavernous room with a soft red glow. There, the calmly cook was waiting for us, with cups of hot tea and bowls of soup. Then, as I sat dazed and wondering over my adventures this evening, with Hakabi lying sleeping with her snout resting on my foot, I leaned forward and laid my head on my folded arms on the top of the table, closed my eyes, and fell asleep. Someone shook me awake in the dark hours before dawn. Starting up, I stared about me wildly. Who is it? Hecate sank down in the chair beside me, her hand reaching out to the pitcher of wine in the wooden goblet that sat on the table. You may relax, Eugenie. She poured two glasses and offered me one. For you are safe. She took a drink and leaned back in the chair. And where you belong. I clutched the glass in my hands, unsure of what exactly she had just said. I'm sorry, w what do you mean? Hecate turned her head and met my sleep-fuddled gaze. You are welcome to remain here for as long as you like, for it is here that you also truly belong. Lifting the cup to her lips, she paused, chuckling once more. Drink your wine, Eugenie. Truly, you are safe. 
Tomorrow, one of my handmaidens will show you to your new rooms. Standing up, the goddess set her hand on the top of my head. Welcome home, my child. And that is the end of my new short story, The Hound of Hecate. Copyright 2020, Celosia Crane. I hope you guys enjoyed this story and we'll return again this coming Saturday for our first episode in the Welsh Mythology series, which will go on through the month of January. I can't wait to bring you guys loads of fun content this next year. I've got a couple of special guests lined up for some surprise appearances. So stay tuned and thank you for listening to Bedtime Stories with Celosia Crane. Bedtime Stories with Celosia Crane is produced solely through the support of my patrons on Patreon. To become a patron for as little as $1 a month, please visit www.patreon.com forward slash Crane.